and it's recording the projector screen as well. All right. Hope I didn't have any weird tabs open. Let's see what happens. <laughs> um, okay, I'm Ryan Zarama. Thanks for uh, stopping by. Uh, just out of curiosity, I know that some of you are, are old hats and regular attenders. I mean, is anybody new to Drupal Commerce or never used Drupal Commerce before? Never used? All right. Got one newbie. Nice. <laughs> what about Ubercard? Did you use Ubercard to do other, other things for e-commerce? Shopify, big commerce. Yeah. All right. Have you ever bought anything on eBay? <laughs> All right. There you go. We found our commonality. <laughs> During COVID, I became a uh, Sega Genesis game collector. So I had the Genesis. It was my high school girlfriend's little brother's, and she did not get it back after we broke up. And so now I have a whole library of Genesis games. <laughs> Thanks to eBay. What's that? Dreamcast. Oh, the Dreamcast is great. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, this, this talk is uh, just titled Unify the Association Digital Experience with Drupal Commerce. It's a big mouthful, um, but the, uh, the genesis of this presentation um, was really that our company, Centaro, has supported a variety of nonprofits, uh, higher educational institutions, some for-profit or trade association companies that function like associations. And you can even think within the Drupal community of the one that we all know and love, the Drupal Association. You know, what, what is it that, that Drupal could do for a company like that? So whether it's for-profit or not-for-profit, you know, what is, what is there to Drupal Commerce that might uh, support the businesses of these companies without requiring them to kind of fragment and fracture their digital experience across multiple platforms? Uh, and, uh, you know, the whole point of this, you know, material that we prepared was really to facilitate sales. Uh, I don't know who does sales for their company or if you're a freelancer and you're involved in sales. Um, when, when you're pitching the abstract qualities of Drupal to somebody, uh, that's just a really tough sale. You know, like, like it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, for example, to sell a truck to somebody who just needs to tow a boat by focusing on anything other than how heavy a boat can this truck tow. <laughs> Um, they don't care how many cup holders it has or whatever, you know, maybe, maybe they do, but you get the idea. Abstract qualities of a platform are not as important as the specific qualities of a platform for a purpose, and that's how you sell. You know, you don't sell uh, flexibility, and I think that's, that's long been a, a challenge within Drupal because we, we like the flexibility of Drupal, so we talk about it, but it doesn't actually convince like a business user to buy nine times out of ten. Unless you have a really technical audience, which we tend to sell to because I'm not a good salesperson. So I just find the people that are just like me and I sell to them. Um, well, the basic agenda is just the introduction, which we're knee-deep in already. Uh, what is Drupal Commerce for those that don't know? Why Drupal Commerce for those that do know and wonder why it's still a thing? Um, and, uh, and then looking specifically into some features relevant to associations. So membership management. Distrib the distribution of premium content, members-only content, you know, specific access control features, uh, and then finally fundraising or other forms of, uh, you know, campaigns that a, an association or a nonprofit or a school might need to run, along with some, you know, case studies and things. And, and I put on the, the, the proposal, uh, like, we're a small group, this is a small camp, uh, it's a small intimate room. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt me, and I'm happy to just, like, show how Drupal Commerce does something. So even if you've used Drupal Commerce but maybe aren't up on the latest modules, you know, let me know and I'm happy to pause and, and just kind of cover anything in depth, even code review if you're interested. So, um, so I'm Ryan. Uh, I got into Drupal in 2005. Does anybody else go that, that far back? Nice. Tom, when did you? I thought you were like... It was 2006 for me. Okay, so, so close, yeah. And uh, I actually was uh, working at a restaurant supply company. And unfortunately, I had my trucker hat from that job until like three weeks ago. And it fell out of my truck and it's gone now. I don't know. I was really bummed when I lost that thing. <laughs> so I actually, I'm actually considering taking like a picture of me in it and finding someone to print that hat again. I'll just get a whole bunch of them. <laughs> so then I'll have it. Um, but my, my very first like paid Drupal engagement was working for Nathan's Famous Hot Dogs. Uh, they had the e-commerce module on their website, and you could buy a pack of hot dogs or maybe swag. I, I don't know if they had, like, cold shipping then or not. But you could at least buy your Nathan's Famous Hot Dog swag. And I think I, I solved some UPS integration problem for them. 
and that kind of turned me on to like, oh, this is interesting. Like, like working on other people's Drupal projects could be a career. How about that? Because until that time, I was just selling blenders on eBay and managing the eBay listings for about 2,500 pieces of refrigeration, which is not a super sexy job, but it paid the bills and it exposed me to open source software in the world of professional software development. Um, I was involved with uh, Ubercart. I, I started that project on Drupal 5 with a co-worker at that company. Uh, we did Drupal 6 as well, but then for Drupal 7, when the fieldable entity system that we now know today was developed, we rebuilt everything from scratch. And that's, that was around the time that we started Commerce Guys as well, merged with the French company, did this whole, whole thing, uh, building that company, building Platform.sh uh, until 2016. You know, it was obvious that like Drupal Commerce was, uh, it was just a means to an end, you know, finding enterprise customers for the hosting company. And so that, that meant it was just kind of atrophying in a sense, you know, it, it needed more attention. And so I was able to work with our, our board and partners to basically carve the business out that we call Centaro and refocus the core team on Drupal Commerce. And it's been great. Um, the, the development of Drupal Commerce on Drupal 8 really needed that dedication and focus. Uh, and, you know, in case you ever got that itch, like, could I maybe start my own Drupal company? Well, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be Drupal. It could be web development or whatever. Like, I didn't have any experience running a business. I just decided to do it, and it worked out. So it's not that hard. If, it, if it's so easy that I could do it, then you can probably manage as well. Um, but uh, but it's, been, it's been good. Uh, the, the experience of building a team that's really just focused on Drupal Commerce expertise has been great. Uh, we get to work with cool people like Tom, who's built two of the largest Drupal Commerce sites ever, probably counting for well over a, a billion dollars in gross revenue between the two. Um, and other people on our team, you know, building awesome, cool, big, ambitious projects as well. Um, and I, I think for me, too, just being able to support end users all over the world is just fun. You know, I'm, I'm still in the Slack, still in Drupal Answers, just answering questions wherever I can. And, um, you yeah, know, it's, it's just fun. And I think, uh, especially when we think about associations and other nonprofits, uh, we, we all have this kind of... Uh, I guess like ethos within the, the Drupal community that we want to do good, right? We want our software to be used for the benefit of real people in the real world, uh, not just be a means to an end. Um, and being able to work with nonprofits, you know, is, is one of those ways to be really like mission aligned. And so like one of the one of the case studies in this deck even was the United Nations uh, is it High Commission on Refugees? I, I always forget what HCR stands for, but it's basically just fundraising you know, money all over the world to support refugees all over the world. Like that, the fact that Drupal and Drupal Commerce gets to be used in that way motivates me and, and I think motivates a lot of us to keep contributing to and building Drupal. Um, so to put the, the bottom line up front uh, for, for you know, my, my thesis statement, if you will, is just that uh, you know, Drupal Commerce is an ideal single platform for organizations to do a lot of things at once all under the same roof. So you just have you know, maybe one web developer or one agency relationship or one software relationship to manage versus uh, you know, migrating to a proprietary platform with a closed roadmap, no insight into their privacy or security practices or accessibility requirements, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, or it's an alternative to using platforms side by side, which creates that kind of fractured user experience where you go here to log in, to manage your profile, but then you have to go over here to log in to pay your membership dues, and then go over here to log in to hopefully access your private reports or whatever the association distributes to its members, that kind of thing. So we're, we're just talking about unifying that digital experience uh, because you know the, the friction it, it is a, like a, it adds real overhead to users and then also to maintainers of these platforms. I think a, a good example for me is, um, you know, the Drupal Association used to support signing up for your membership on Drupal.org. Now it's off-site on Classy, and uh, when it came time for my renewal, I honestly, I, I was like, I don't, I don't actually remember where to go to see if I auto-renew, or am I supposed to go pay again? Like, because I, I, it, it wasn't part of my Drupal user account anymore. And so, like, like those kinds of uh, points of friction that we're trying to eliminate by advocating for a unified platform. Um, last but not least, you can always bolt widgets onto your Drupal site. A lot of people do that. No, no real harm in that. Um, but, you know, Drupal Camp Asheville, for example, uses Eventbrite. And what, what if the, the camp knew 
that all the attendees from last year are our target audience for reattending this year, and we sent them out all an email, you know, right before the registrations went live, and, and, and that was just kind of building this record on the camp website itself. You know, you could imagine a, a more unified digital experience for something like a camp versus Eventbrite and then an, an open collective for big fees and so on and so forth, you know, donations or sponsorships, whatever. Um, that said, uh, oh, well, okay, I thought, I thought there was a different slide right here, my bad. There's, a, there's another slide for the that said, if you can just put a pin in that. <laughs> um, so just to, just to real briefly, you know, make sure everybody understands what Drupal Commerce is. Um, we, we talk about it internally as an ecosystem. It's not, just a, uh, it's not just a module that you just add on to your Drupal site and you go to town. Uh, and, and in fact, it's not you know, just like 10 modules. It's really like 20 modules in the core package. And then any of a dozen modules that are in our contributed module ecosystem that you're likely going to need to add to your site to get additional functionality. Um, but it, it, you know, all together, this ecosystem presents itself to the market as an open source e-commerce platform. And that's the magic word, right? Because people are going to compare us against Magento. They're going to compare us against Shopify, BigCommerce, Demandware, Hybris, commerce tools. They, they, we're in that space, even if Drupal Commerce and Drupal sites in general are functionally unique pieces of software. You know, nobody else really has the model that we do, except maybe WooCommerce or Cilius, you know, these, these other, like, just pure play open source um, platforms. Um, but the, the scale of Drupal Commerce, you know, is about 40,000 online stores, billions of dollars a year in gross transaction volume with merchants all over the world. Like, I've, I've supported people uh, probably everywhere except Africa. No, I've actually done uh, some stuff for a Nigerian company and... Uh, so I like the, the reach just by being part of the Drupal community is pretty immense. And it's a lot of fun to, to get to experience that around the world. Um, but the, the commerce core is basically, um, it's, its job is just to provide uh, orders, order items, products, like the, the core entities that you would build everything in an online store with. And then all these contributor modules add additional functionality to it or subsystems and then we tie it all together with a default theme called Belgrade into Commerce Kickstart, which um, Kickstart is, is uh, like a classic Drupal distribution where we just package everything together. It's code, it's an installation profile, it's default configuration. In this case, we even have a, a separate module called Commerce Demo that provides default content so that you can literally just have a, like a one-click install of a full demo store to see all that Drupal Commerce can do. And I have this installed and running locally, so we can, we can cruise through that if we want to. Um, but it's uh, using Layout Builder and Bootstrap and the Bootstrap Styles module to give you kind of like a full page building interface that's not as like good, maybe, as uh, um, Squarespace or some of the more advanced WordPress templating systems, but it's not terrible either. Um, and uh, we've integrated Search API into it to demonstrate how to do faceted catalogs, advanced search interfaces, uh, obviously, out of the box, this would just be tied into the Drupal database, but most of our customers are using Apache Solar or Elastic Enterprise Search as the search backend, but still using views and the Drupal theming layer to, to present the product catalog. Uh, of course, there's you know multiple checkout flows, but you have like a default checkout flow that looks a lot like Shopify would out of the box. Um, but within Drupal Commerce, every uh, order type that you define can be correlated to a unique checkout flow. So if I have some orders that require a shipping address and some that don't, well, I can, I can differentiate that within one Drupal Commerce site so that if I just add a digital download to my cart, Kickstart would not collect the shipping address for me. Uh, and that's, you know, that's basically what it looks like on the front end. On the back end, there's a full dashboard that provides a simple... Uh, sales statistics section. It's not a full reporting system, uh, but it does do like your, your kind of high level store statistics. And when I worked at an e-commerce company, I mean, that is basically what we would look at on a daily basis. How did we do today? Or how are we doing this week? Or this month versus last month? And so that's why that's there. You can compare this year to date to the prior year to date to compare this month to last month, that kind of thing. Uh, there's a, a, a bit of a, like a, a messaging system so that if there are important messages for us to push out to end users, we can. Right now, we haven't ever actually used that because those kinds of events are fairly rare. 
Uh, we didn't miss a window where we were supposed to push out a message <laughs> when UPS decided to drop API key support. No, we didn't miss it because they bumped it to August. Oh, we can still do it. Okay, yeah, UPS basically is dropping direct uh, API key based access to their uh, APIs, and you have to switch to OAuth tokens. And so we, we we don't want people to miss the boat because then their checkout form would stop working. So that's that's the kind of thing that this interface was designed to provide alerts for. Um, and of course, yeah, you got the, all, all the contributed modules. I, I don't know how many contribs there are these days. I know there's at least like 145 payment gateway modules alone, and then some hundreds more uh, modules that just had individual features. And you know, I, like some were like one-offs that we developed for customers, like commerce product limits. Like, okay, you can only purchase one of these a month. And we had that use case for a customer, so boom, we we wrote the feature, we released it as a module. Now it's just part of the package. Minimum orders, repeat orders, the whole invoicing ecosystem. Of course, the whole shipping ecosystem then also has plugins for various carriers and abstract shipping services like ShipStation and EasyPost and that kind of thing. Um, there's just a, a lot under the hood. And of course, you know, it's endlessly customizable uh, for you to write your own modules for. <laughs> um, and uh, this, this now brings us back to the that said, you know, like we, we advocate for unifying the, the digital experience in a single platform. But like it's just, it's just not the best idea for everybody. <laughs> and so this, this is another part of sales, right? It's like when you're talking to somebody knowing when to say, hey, you know what, we actually aren't a good fit for you. Let me, let me just leave you be and maybe I can point you in the right direction. Um, this is what, what outsourcing firms are not good at doing is deciding, when, re realizing when they're not good for your business and they keep calling you every single day. <laughs> uh, uh, but, uh, but you know, like, there are companies that are just better served by things they can buy versus things they can build. Because uh, uh, I, I believe it was Jeff Eaton, in, you know, an old Drupal developer, that coined the phrase, open source is free as in puppies. Now you're free to take one, but it's not your responsibility to, to love and care for and feed and potty train and so on and so forth. Like, like, there are many organizations that just do not have the wherewithal or the budget to build and manage a Drupal site. And they should be using a hosted WordPress or Shopify or wh whatever the case may be. And, um, you know, as much as it pains me as an open source advocate and an enthusiast, like, we, we know that we aren't going to be for everybody. and We don't pretend that we can be. However, um, you know, there, there are some people that do need to build versus buy. Um, some people have uh, exposure to regulatory or, you know, oversight that, that would mandate they not use certain systems. I mean, they can't use Shopify because it doesn't conform to whatever their HIPAA compliance requirements are. Maybe they can't use big commerce or whatever. You know, I don't know what other systems that, that might preclude. Um, but, you know, it's, it's not uncommon, um, especially if you get into higher education or government um, projects uh, or NGOs that they have accessibility requirements, uh, privacy compliance, data security requirements that that you just can't meet with certain forms of off-the-shelf software. Hence, Drupal Commerce. Um, so if you choose Drupal Commerce, you know, what do you already get? You already get, like I said before, a layout builder. That's good enough, and it's getting better. Uh, I think that the WYSIWYG editor is better, you know, in better shape than the layout builder is, and that's probably because it's not something we didn't build ourselves. We just bolted on CK editor and integrated that with the entity system. Um, but you look at something like... Uh, what uh, the, the Drupal Starshot initiative purports to do with Layout Builder, that's pretty interesting. You know, making Layout Builder a nicer tool and then rebranding it as the Experience Builder, because why not? It's a digital experience, I guess. Um, like that, like, that should be good. I, I, hope. I, ho I hope that it's something that we can say to uh, a nonprofit or to an association, like, hey, we're going to set this up for you. And now your marketing staff can take it from here and build whatever layouts you want, whatever components you need to drop into place. You know, it's there in your pattern library that we've set up for you. Go have fun. And I, and I, I mean, I, I think it's a pretty common use case in the enterprise. People expect the marketing team to be provided tools like that. Um, and, and of course, all of our competitors say they do that, even if they do it poorly. And so we have to have something that shows that. You know, if you work at a, a major corporation, the marketing team doesn't have to go to the development team to design a new landing page. Um, you know, with Drupal Commerce, you also have full integration with the views module because every entity in Drupal Commerce is using the same API as every node, every user, every file. 
Um, so of course, you know, any product listing page, any search interface that you can imagine you can build. Uh, similarly, you know, being linked into the access control systems lets you do the same thing with private content or other forms of governed access to certain portions of a website. Uh, you know, one, one customer that we're uh, engaging even recently, they have just a whole section that's just members-only information for their association. And uh, it's not rocket science to do that in Drupal. You get the access control list module, the content access module, you restrict that node type to members of this role, and boom, it's, it's there. Uh, and that's actually something that's like pretty challenging to do in other contexts. Uh, or, you know, maybe it's easy to have content published to your association management software that only members can see, but what if you want teasers of that content to show up on the public page so that you can convince people to buy from you? Well, there's no integration between these things. So there's a, a tire manufacturing association that has that issue where, like, they have a Drupal website, but they use a separate AMS. Well, how can we feed content from point B into back into point A? Uh, for the sake of sales or other just outbound marketing, well, they, they can't. They're stuck. They, well, realistically, they just copy and paste and not have to maintain the same content twice. Um, obviously, uh, you know, any, any other uh, forms of access control you're using, like the domain suite, you know, we're fully integrated with. Uh, you can even, you know, run multiple sites off of a single Drupal Commerce instance that's like, Domain A correlates to a certain store within the Drupal Commerce backend, and then all of the products and orders related to that store are, um, you know, correlated to each other based on the domain used to access the website. So, good integration with that ecosystem. We use that extensively for one of our university customers. And who knows what else? I mean, one-off payments, recurring payments, promotion systems, the whole nine yards. If you're curious, we published this. Uh, kind of like full mega features list um, at, you know, on centaur.io. Uh, and uh, it just kind of was, was just about anything we can imagine you might do with Drupal Commerce. It's not a deep dive into every feature set, but the goal is for that to be you know, something we can like cross-link to this or that documentation page or this or that blog post on our website. So some of it's beginning to be cross-linked. Uh, because all of our competitors have something like that. We resisted putting a features list together for years because, oh, Drupal's abstract and flexible and it's whatever you want to build. But people needed to see that. So feel free to use that content in your own proposals and presentations. If you ever need to copy and paste something, be my guest. Uh, unless you're bidding against me, in which case I'll cry foul. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Um, that said, you know, I, I'm not going to read this whole screen. Uh, but I, I think that most of us are, are pretty aware that you know, with Drupal, you know, you have your default feature set, but it really is, the sky's the limit when you start to mix and match things together. And, um, you know, this extends even to new features and, and subsystems that didn't exist when we wrote Commerce. Uh, the, 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 the classic example is uh, rules was not ready and didn't appear to be getting ported to Drupal 8. So we actually wrote Drupal Commerce 2 completely separate from rules, and we just built our own condition system for the things that needed conditions. So payment method availability, or shipping rate availability, or promotion applicability, coupon applicability, like all that was kind of in our own condition plugin, and we just kind of forewent any sort of rules integration. Well, now there's the ECA module, which you may have heard of. Uh, what is it? In, in, entity condition action module, I think? Yeah. Event condition action, yeah. Yeah, and so, so it's, it's basically taking the place of rules, but maybe even not, does it have like a visual user interface now? Yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah, much, much nicer. I mean, like, like rules was basically, it was like the Drupal equivalent of the, uh, the scripting engine in the Bard's Tale construction kit. Did anybody play that? The Bard's Tale dungeon diving games back in the day? Well, basically you had to know, you had to know the rules scripting language. So it's like, it's one of those like non-developer, it's like a tool for non-developers that you had to be a developer to understand how to use. <laughs> like, you had to know how variable scopes work, otherwise you just couldn't use rules. So ECA is, is, is more user friendly. I think it's aiming at the more like site builder audience that maybe doesn't know variable scoping or subroutine management or things like that. Uh, and, and you know, so, like I haven't even played with it yet. I just know that it's there and that it has commerce integration and maybe it's great. If you try it out, if you've used it, let me know. H has anybody paired the two by any chance? All right, I thought I'd ask. Small crap, so I didn't know. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, uh, 
I'd, I'd say that like our our maintenance philosophy, you know, at the Commerce Core, like it, it prioritizes this. Even if at the ecosystem level, we're trying to speak more about individual features and prepackaged feature sets. Um, so, you know, certainly if you have, in, you know, thoughts for improvement in Drupal Commerce. You know, unless it n needs an abstract solution, we would probably say, well, that should be a contributor module, but we're always open to revisiting parts of Commerce Core that need to be improved, particularly the payments uh, API, because that sucks. So um, let's delve into specific features or case studies, really, um, that, that um, support associations. And uh, these are going to be like, you know, real, real examples. I think mostly our customers. If not, there may be some prospects that we haven't turned customers yet. <laughs> but I know all about their sites, so they, uh, and they are in Drupal. So these are all Drupal sites. We can at least say that. Um, you know, this this customer uh, is basically running uh, an all-you-can-eat uh, private library of video, image, and audio content. It's so, like if, if you, it's it's basically a, a trade association. If you were part of the body. Um, or part of the the videography industry, whatever that is, you know, making commercials and other videos, then you would subscribe and get all you could eat access. And so uh, this is the interface for the commerce um, recurring module. So the commerce recurring module um, defines a uh, subscription entity. These are all subscription entities. Uh, and uh, it is a bundleable entity type, meaning you can have multiple types of subscriptions. In this case, you have a, a primary and then also sub-membership. So if you have a corporate subscriber, they can get access to five licenses or five memberships. So they like sub-license to other staff. Uh, and it can be integrated with uh, either recurring billing or um, uh, just require manual renewal. And I was actually wrong. This is the license UI. The subscriptions UI is separate, but they're very similar. That's why I was confused. And Tom probably was too, because you're like, no, those are licenses. <laughs> uh, anyways, um, but the idea is that the, you know, a member would have a license or a subscription based on, you know, does the membership have uh, additional entitlements associated with it? In this case, it's role-based access. You're assigned a role upon membership activation, and then that role gets you full access to the library of material. Um, other people uh, that we've worked with, you know, one is a, uh, uh, a, a library of legal briefings for consumer, uh, consumer law firms. And if you want access to everything they've ever written about different case law, then you pay them either per piece of content you want access to, or you buy an all-you-can-eat uh, membership to the site and then have access to the full library. And there again, you see the advantage of integrating uh, your e-commerce component there, your membership management, renewals, whatever, with Drupal, since you're literally selling content. <laughs> Tying those two things together just makes a lot of sense. Otherwise, what we've had to do with other systems, uh, we worked with a small uh, film distribution company, and you could buy the rights to access a film from their Drupal Commerce store, but they then just basically created a small API bridge to a third-party platform to determine the, the DRM for streaming videos and things. Uh, whereas they, they could have just, you know, done that natively without any kind of integration, but that's, that's just not how that worked out. Um, anyway, so when you're dealing with membership management, you're either going to use, um, like, licenses, if it's, say, associating a membership with a user role, uh, or with um, access to download certain files or access to particular forms of content. And, and really, like, uh, license types and, and subscription types are meant to be easy to define. Uh, so I had a friend, this is a bit of a different industry, but he's in the games industry. He wanted to sell digital goods for one of his games. So I was like, oh, cool. Like, I'll just define you a license type that just, you know, generates and distributes API keys. And then you can, you know, integrate that with your game back in. And boom, he now has digital goods that he can sell through his storefront. Um, so let's see, that's uh, membership management. You know, yeah, obviously, when, when it comes to recurring billing, um, Drupal Commerce does seamlessly handle tokenized payment methods for you. Uh, so card on file payment, basically. Um, and that's going to vary, you know, functionality varies based on your payment gateway. Uh, but uh, typically, you're just retaining a token that paired with your API credentials is going to let you process a payment through a particular payment gateway account. It's um, very nice and PCI friendly. Uh, we don't say that like the software itself is PCI compliant. You have to self-assess and whatever your, your own build once you're done. 
Uh, but but our, all of our favorite payment method providers are, you know, SAQ, AEP, like the, the least onerous uh, uh, PCI standards to, to uh, comply with. Um, I was trying to think, like, what other membership management um, systems we have. Um, I said this, this new uh, association that we're engaging, they were using Nimble as their association management service. And they just had no control whatsoever over the checkout flow, which is a, which is a problem because they, they, were, they were oriented at people in uh, like a specific medical industry. And they, they, they needed to collect certain information as part of the membership onboarding flow. And so what they ended up having to do was using Nimble to let somebody pot, like purchase their membership but they couldn't have anything else in the card. It was all just one at a time, and then they were very restricted in what they could collect, you know, all of their, their practice information, where are they based, where are they licensed to operate, you know, all that stuff that you would need to know about your membership. And so they actually just ditched the AMS, and they're just going to bring everything back into Drupal because they, they really just, I, I think they were quoted some, you know, ridiculously high number to customize the SaaS, you know, to, to do what they need. So, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's nimble and it is not. <laughs> um, so yeah, we've already you know talked about the premium content use case, and this one was I thought really interesting, uh, and I wish that more we, we could find more customers like them, because uh, it's it's a pretty basic continuing education provider for engineers of uh, various stripes. You know, you can see all the different uh, engineering disciplines on the sidebar there. And uh, what they do is they, they use Drupal's quiz module to test your understanding of the material. So you have an entire course that you go through, and then you take the quiz, and when you see your grade, you then can purchase the credit. So you literally you can do your entire CE hours, and by the time you've invested all of this time into passing the quiz, well, of course you're going to pay for the certificate that proves that you did the course. So literally, like, all of the content is freely available, and only at the point of actually like stamping the, the, the accreditation on your, your completion do you have to pay them money. And I thought, man, that's a great business. I wish I'd thought of that. You know, like, and I honestly, like, I'd love to go find an industry and just do this. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to certify the, the, the hot dog stand industry or something. You know? and, and, and you don't even have to be like, I, I don't think that he's an accreditor. You know, he works with the specific accreditation um, you know, uh, bodies. To, to make sure that his coursework is all approved and you get the credits. But we've, we've had multiple such CE providers. Um, MTMI.net is another one that's on Commerce, too. Um, ah, shoot, I can't remember all of our different ones. Do I have another one in here? Oh, well, MTMI is in there, okay. Um, but there, there were others that we were doing. Um, oh, I, there was a dental supply company um, that, that offers CE courses. And again, they're, they're not the accreditor, but they have courses related to their technology that they're selling. And so during COVID, they couldn't do field sales. And so they just got like all these dentist offices to come and watch coursework on their website. And I said, well, look, all you got to do is integrate your existing Drupal Commerce checkout flow with your content. And boom, you can be selling this material. And, and obviously for them, it's, it's, a, it's a lead generation mechanism as well. You're literally paying people to become your product customers. Or sorry, they're paying to become your customer. That's how that works. So... Anyways, with, with MTMI, what was interesting about them, too, is that, like, again, it's under the heading of premium content, some of these courses are online. So you might buy access to view videos that are just in their video library and then be tested on your knowledge. Or live stream, uh, I think what they would call, uh, it's not on demand, it's like, oh, shoot, they, maybe they just call it scheduled, I don't know. But basically, we, we had you know, one product display page that had variations for either the on-demand content or pick the date that you want to join the webinar. And then you're given a link to come to the page on the site to then join the class and um, gain your credit hours for you know, taking part of that course. And they, they also tied that into like, real-world in-personal training as well, which, of course, we know Drupal has um, modules for events management, for calendaring, if you need to put together a full calendar of all the courses being you know, uh, made available in a particular training location. So it's really cool stuff. Uh, and in this case, you know, again, like, like I love the fact that we're able to support companies like this because uh, it's important. I mean, I, my, my wife just had an MRI uh, on her knee. She tore, uh, tore a tendon. So there, maybe, uh, maybe that doctor has actually used my website that I helped build, you know, to maintain his uh, certification on that machinery. So it's cool stuff. 
Um, and I'm sure there are other use cases for premium content. Obviously, file downloads are fully supported by Drupal Commerce. There's the Commerce File module that extends the Commerce License module. And it's just uh, applying Drupal's private file access control systems to uh, licensed content. And so basically, if you buy access to the files attached to a product variation, uh, any time those files change, you get access to all of them. So if a new version comes out and you just want to like grant perpetual access to updates, you just add it back to that same product. And any person who's purchased that content will see the new versions and be able to download them. Uh, and in case you aren't aware, that is fully integrated with Amazon S3. So you can host your content you know, on S3 where storage is a lot cheaper, distribution is a lot cheaper. It's not your bandwidth. Although I guess it is your bandwidth, right? Because it'd still be streamed through the private file system unless you're doing one-off token generation. I, I can't remember how S3 works with the private file system. Yeah. Um, anywho, um, so that's you know obviously a, a great use case for associations. Finally, fundraising, other forms of campaigns. There's, of course, the typical use case, which is just taking donations. So there's a campaign. I find my campaign landing page. In this case, I don't remember which one I was on. I think it was just donating to the general fund for the UNHCR, but you could literally go and find, you know, donate to support for Ukrainian refugees or support for uh, South Sudanese refugees or Nigerian refugees or Palestinian refugees, although they might have their own through UNRWA. But, like, you know, every, any, any cause that you could think to give money to, you can find a way to donate to them through this website. And they're, they're global. So it, this is only showing, you know, donations in U.S. dollars. Well, I guess I could have clicked the, the drop-down. Um, but, you know, they, the, this website is one Drupal Commerce site using the domain module to correlate which domain you're coming through to the default currency for that store uh, and that campaign that you're buying from. And then it will even pair you with a regional payment gateway. So if you're in Dubai, you know, your payment gateway is going to be different than if you're in the United States making that donation, most likely. Um, and there are some global providers like Adyen or Stripe, I think, has pretty global uh, availability now. But still, like, there's still some countries where it's a different payment gateway, you know, is, is their preference. Um, and then, of course, as you can see, this supports both um, one-time and recurring donations. Um, and you can, uh, you know, select from a prefix uh, uh, donation amount or just put in your own. This is all just using kind of Default features of Drupal Commerce, so like uh, the, the add to cart form, you know, what you see here is functionally an order item add form. It's, it's just a type of entity. The add form is literally a form mode in the forms inter in the, uh, the fields interface. So you can decide what fields appear here in what order, uh, and that, that can differ based on the product type or the product variation type. Right, I guess in this case it would be the order item type, which correlates to the product and yada yada. Um, and so, you know, if, if you need to collect additional information with that, you know, whether it's, let's say that you're activating that license, you know, to, to, or, or activating that membership in the association or whatever it may be, but perhaps in your use case, you're activating it on behalf of somebody else. And so I might check a box to designate this is going to be somebody else's thing. And then I might, you know, render using the state's API an email field where I then collect the email address that I'm purchasing on behalf of. Not uncommon, you know, for associations, you know, the, the memberships to be managed by a secretary or somebody else in an office or in a practice. Um, so, that, you know, th this is very, very customizable. And since this is using recurring, the end result would be for a one-off payment, nothing. Just a saved payment method and order history of receipt. I can download my, my receipt. Uh, but for a subscription, then I would have uh, access through my user account. Although I don't think they create user accounts. I can't remember in their use case. But... Um, you know, where I can go cancel my subscription, manage manage my recurring subscription, renewal, donation, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then I'd have that subscription entity that's the canonical record of my recurring payment. Uh, and then I'd have an order. There's the initial order whenever I first check out. And then there'll be a recurring order. It's a different order type for each of my renewals. And, um, you know, you have the ability to... Uh, manage different uh, data for a renewal versus the initial transaction. Very, you know, infinitely customizable billing periods, billing intervals, yada yada. It's all pretty robust. Um, and uh, you know, also uh, there are tools in there for dunning management. So, like, if a, if a credit card payment fails, well, how many days should I wait before I try again? And what email should I send out to let somebody know that their payment failed? The, the one thing that it doesn't do, I think, maybe we had these cases like pre-notify. Did we do that for 
any of our current customers like, like basically like a month before it's going to renew like send an email out like hey don't forget you're about to renew double check your payment info I, th I thought we had that use case for somebody but. yeah that conversation sounds familiar yeah hey. <laughs> it's somewhere um, and then if you're not doing just traditional funders maybe, maybe you're doing crowdfunding which uh, this company is and this is a Drupal Commerce site it's in our backyard IOBY and what they do is they basically would let like a neighborhood association or a borough or whatever. I think this is kind of started in New York, so you got different um, boroughs and neighborhoods where you can can create a community initiative. So that, let's say that it's you, you want to raise money for a community garden or raise money for a dog park or whatever the case may be. You'd come in here and um, create that campaign, set your goal, and then all, all they're doing, you know, because you have all of this content tightly integrated, this is a product. Every product has a variation. That's where the SKU and the price and things are by default. And then when you add your donation to your cart, you know, have an order item, that order item maintains that relationship. So literally all I have to do is a single database query that says sum up the amount, the unit price of all these donation items that correlate to this particular campaign. And then, you know, maybe pass it to JavaScript to render it in a pretty graph or something. But the data is there, and then it can be integrated with the content. It can be indexed with the view. It can be cached at the CDN. You know, whatever whatever your your use case may be. You know, it's just right there within Drupal, and you're not having to do some say third party API request or some sort of bi directional integration. Um, pretty cool. Um, and I would love for them to upgrade to Drupal 10, and I'd love for them to do that with us. So if you're listening, IOBY, uh, you know where to find us. <laughs> um, and so those are, those are some of the primary like fundraising uh, use cases. Uh, nothing else is really coming to mind. Um, just trying to think. You know, we, we work with a, a company um, called IPC that maintains standards. They're a standards body for the electronics manufacturing industry. And they're the, like just a great case study for all the various things you can do with Drupal Commerce. Because uh, they, they kind of like they literally do everything. Like membership management, it's a CRM with SSO between different sites using an OAuth token, you know, generated by. I think they use a, like a Drupal server as their application server, but it could be a different different one. And then it's also integrated with NetSuite. So there's this bi-directional, you know, integration with their ERP, and you can generate quotes over here and then pay for them in Drupal and so on and so forth. But like. Um, one of the, the biggest things that that company was responsible for is expanding the B2B feature set. And that's why we, we do try to focus on associations because like that B2B feature set is just a bit more robust and a bit more complex than the typical like B2C uh, relationship for donations or membership organizations or what have you. And that's where you, you have those things like sub-licensing or having a corporate account that everybody who's in my group or my business account uh, has access to the same files and content that we've purchased on behalf of everybody in the company. Uh, those kinds of things are possible through the commerce, or is it G commerce, the group commerce integration module that Tom maintains. And um, uh, again, the, the full suite of invoicing and other stuff that, you know, paying on terms may be relevant if you're selling B2B. So. Uh, that's that's all I've got from the slide deck standpoint. And I just thought I'd see like, are there any like any any questions about um, you know any of the content that I presented or anything that you might like to see within the the demo site? Yeah. Yeah, a few questions. Um, so you, you mentioned groups a few times. Does it does it play with groups proper or not really? Uh, yeah. So the question is, you know, how, how does Drupal integrate with groups? And um, basically, like. The G-Commerce module, I think it's basically exposing uh, different commerce entities to be assigned to groups for access control. Uh, and then, you know, that, that applies to order histories, um, licenses, order. address entries, maybe shared payment methods as well. I can't remember. No, okay. But definitely orders, products. You know. Yeah, so it is, it is a direct integration with the, the group module. Okay. Okay. Do we have anything else besides the group content, like definitions? Like any default roles or? So, I mean, out of the box, it's, it's open ended. So you can, you, can, like, you can decide whether you want to have your orders shared between all members of your group, which could be your company or organization or association. Okay. So there's, there's a lot of flexibility there. It basically allows mm -hmm. from the group module for you to specify that access per entity type. Okay. 
Yeah, and like the one, the one drawback of using group for this is that you have like all that language. You know, it's not really a group. It's a it's a it's a customer account really, with users of that customer. I don't, you know, you can you can change that stuff if it matters to your customer. Um, and also, like, there's just a lot in group. You know, that you just may not need. You know, <laughs> like. Oh. So I, I mean, maybe someday we'll have like our own business customer module that just adds a much lighter weight, you know, tiering to, to customer accounts. But right now, group is group is it. Okay. Yeah. And uh, any like Web three payment methods, or is that sort of like out of scope? Or? There, yes, for Web three payment methods, like there were gateways that were purporting to offer that, like Bitnet, I think was one for a while. Uh -huh. I don't know. Does Stripe have any? Token-based payments, yeah. I mean, what about but I guess Square and PayPal, maybe? I, I could do, like, a Commerce Coinbase or something. Yeah, I, I feel like I've seen somebody attempt that. I mean, because, yeah, it wouldn't be hard to to just create, like, define a payment gateway where the, the payment that gets created is just watching a chain to see a particular amount, you know, go through the chain and then update the status of the payment. But I, I don't, hadn't seen anything recently. I feel like that, that peaked around like 2019. Right. I remember like at DrupalCon Amsterdam, it was probably the last time I saw like somebody actually like talking about that. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, the floor so, is still here. Yeah, I mean, I guess so. Like, yeah. CRM um, is is maybe like a, a a different way to go, right? With with like yeah, uh, if you need a full on CRM for sure. Yeah. Blah, I guess. I don't know. I, don't know. I, I guess would, would there be a reason to go with counter over that? Or? Man, I don't even know. I haven't used Civic CRM since like the Ubercart days. Like, it was very tightly correlated to Drupal for a while. Yeah. And um, yeah, eventually they just, they just added like the direct e commerce integration. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Couldn't tell you. Yeah. Probably, probably just a question of like, are you already using a CRM or not? Right. If you already have a CRM and you don't need. A CRM, then you may not replatform the CRM, but you might still use Drupal for everything else. But, yeah. Any other questions, Dan? Any more from you? <laughs> I mean, do you? Do you maintain sites that use Civi right now? Or um, I mean, I, I dorked around with it a little bit, but I just got a real CRM done. Okay. For yeah. Yeah. I, I use PipeDrive personally, and it's fine. Yeah, it's like cheap and easy. Yeah. Yeah, I like PipeDrive a lot, actually. Anything, anything in particular you want to see in the back end? I mean, there, one, one thing that I did on this site was I did install like the content ACL and content access modules. And so like theoretically I could, you know, create um, private content, in this case, you know, like a legal briefing that's only accessible uh, to members. So I tried to go in there to, assuming my permissions got rebuilt properly. You know, I'm, I'm not able to access that. Uh, but if, oh uh, shoot, huh, I don't think that it's going to show up in my product catalog. Let's just see. Yeah, okay, that's all the default content. I'm going to have to, to log back in to, uh, to find the node, or the, the right, um, the right product. So let's log out here. I'm on what product twenty seven. All right, so I'm gonna buy an all access membership, and whenever I buy this, I'm getting a license created for me that has a. Um, I guess I'll create a customer. Why not? Um, this is really hard. I should have figured out how to mirror. <laughs> um, it's going to grant me access to an access control list by ID that uh, that has just full access to that node type. I mean, so nothing nothing groundbreaking here, but you can see that I'm, I don't have any shippable products in my cart, and so it's using the, the digital checkout flow and order type, which is nice. This is just a dummy payment gateway. Although well, that is a real address. No, actually, I, I wish it was a real address, but it's not. <laughs> All right. For some reason, the address field module does not like Google's autocomplete. Uh, 
Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, if I, I well, I'm, I'm logged in now. So that checkout flow must be configured to create a user account automatically for you and assign you to your order upon checkout completion. Uh, if I go look at my account page, can I? Oh, that's weird though. Why does it want me to rebuild permissions? <laughs> I feel like I should not have seen that status message. I don't know what that was for. And I don't know why I can't click the My Account link. Heh. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Well, if I log back in, is well, what was it, Node 2? So I should be able to access that node now. And uh, it's just, again, using the ACL module, if you look in the database, I'm now part of this access control list that has access to this node. There's the commerce license access control module that also kind of, um, kind of would tie it together to like a specific piece of content. So if you wanted this product to be able to grant me access to that node, you'd use something like this where the, you have much more fine-grained um, control. I just did like a role-based access control list for that um, quick example. But I don't get what's going on in the header bar there. there uh, I know that Drupal 10.3 kind of messed up our theme, like status messages stopped rendering properly and a few other things, but that, that button should still work because I downgraded to 10.26. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Um, and here's the, the license interface, so I can see that, that, you know, who my subscribers are, what do they have license to, when does it expire, this particular license type, I configured it so that it could be automatically, uh, or sorry, manually renewed up to one month before the expiration date, so a lot, a lot of those features are there, so you can have manual renewals if you don't want to do full-on automated recurring billing. Uh, and, yeah, there are other, other quality of life features, like, you know, helping somebody avoid buying the same product twice if it doesn't make sense to sell them the same license again, blah, blah, blah. So all kinds of stuff there in the license suite. Uh, I don't. I guess I have the recurring module enabled, but we don't have any, anything like configured for it right now. I don't even know if I had a license subscription. Yeah, so I could, I could, could just define a subscription, but typically the subscription will be created for you upon uh, order placement or checkout completion, basically. They're, they're, they're closely tied together. Um, but every subscription is to like a particular product variation. And then if I have multiple subscriptions, they would all be kind of condensed together for the sake of billing and renewal orders and stuff like that. So it'll handle proration. It'll handle, you know, picking a particular date for when it should renew or when it should start. It's a free trial period. It's the whole nine yards. Um, yeah, any, any other questions or do we wrap it up there? One last one, Beth. Bring it. Well, you can have two. Do you have a roadmap or what's, what are you, what's coming new? Yeah, um, yeah, so right now, I mean, we, we can only see a few months into the future, unfortunately. So we, we have like a DrupalCon uh, Barcelona ambition um, to get the Commerce Kickstart 3.0 fully tagged and to get Commerce Recurring fully tagged. We don't have a, a full 1.0 release for that. And there are just a few, like, pretty key things we'd like to fix in that module before we call it a good solid 1.0. Um, beyond that, um, you know, I, like it's it's hard to say. Like we have we have our own product that we're developing. It's called um, Centauro Insights, and it's just like a full um, web analytics embedded dashboard in the back end of Drupal Commerce. And so, like, it basically replaces the sales stats on the dashboard with a with a full reporting tool. So pretty graphs and exports and that whole thing. Um, we'd like to, you know, dabble in distributing that as SaaS and see what happens. So it's all backed by like MongoDB. So we have to charge for it because we're, we're being charged to run it. But we'll see how that goes. Um, and then, uh, like, we'd, we'd love to do a 3.0 that had more, um, like, more big ideas in it. Like, like I said, we, we kind of need to redevelop the payment system. We're just not super happy with the way that payments are modeled in the back end of, of commerce. Uh, so, like, you have, you have every order has a payments tab. Um, but the problem is, like, this only shows successful payment attempts. So what if I want to debug somebody's payment failure? Oh, yeah, that was important, and that was really easy to do in Commerce 1 because every payment attempt was its own payment transaction entity. Um, so that was a bit of a screw-up when we were kind of deciding on the architecture here. So we at least have, like, an open issue that I don't think has landed yet, um, to put every failed payment attempt in the uh, activity stream on the order. But there's still some more work to do there. And, and really just like, 
it's hard to know like what, what the, the ultimate architecture should be relating payment gateways to configurations to payment methods and payment types. Like there's just some, some brittleness there. Uh, and then the, the way that that integrates into the checkout flow also like is a bit confusing because we, we have like, like two interfaces you can pick from to integrate a new payment gateway. It's the on-site payment gateway base or the off-site payment gateway base. And, you know, those sound pretty straightforward. On-site is like I'm just collecting information and sending an API request, and boom, the payment's captured. And then off-site is like, oh, I'm going to redirect to PayPal, and then I'll come back to complete payment. But the entire industry standardized on, like, off-site but on-site by embedding iframes on the, on the page, right? So it's technically an off-site payment because it's happening off, like, it's happening through somebody else's domain, but it's on-site because it's on your own site in an iframe. That's just confusing language, and so, so in... In practice, you know, every, everyone that does a new integration is kind of bastardizing that system to get the payment element embedded in the right spot and, you know, make 3DS work, you know, the, the secure customer authentication, make that work properly. So there's some, some thing we need to do there. Um, and I don't know, like, what other real big ideas we have. Um, like the, the, the biggest thing to me is that, like, we're not really happy... Like the, the order view page is great. It's nice and clear. It's easy to customize. Uh, you have a template if you want to go theme it, however you want it to look. But the order edit page is like a pile of crap. So um, at least we have address book integration on the back end now. But order item management is really confusing. You know, as, as, a, as a, uh, a CSR, like if I want to add an item to the order, like what, why, why am I having to pick like a, an order item type first? That's just kind of weird frankly. And it probably it would have been better even as separate buttons, but, but the reality is like a CSR, they don't really care what the order item type is. They'd rather find the SKU first and have it pick the order item type it's supposed to be, which we have that association in the back end of commerce. But because this is just using inline entity form still, it's the last place in commerce it does. Like we don't have the ability to say, well, cha change the uh, change this selection form to be based on something else. It's just It just is what is there by default. So you know, like, there's probably no real scenario where in a CSR should be manually adjusting these adjustments. Um, you know, it's it's hard to know how to apply pricing rules. So, so like like I would love to just reimagine that, uh, or even you know maybe just have that be just managed via modal dialogues on the view page. You know, like, like what if there just wasn't an edit page at all? But I clicked, you know, a little edit icon here, you know, for an individual order item and a, and a modal just popped up. Or, I, you know, I clicked add and a modal, and, and then everything kind of refreshed for me. I feel like that, that would feel more natural. Um, so, so definitely some thinking to do there. Um, and then we, we probably just were too constrained by, like, like, how does Drupal manage entities whenever we hit that? So, so yeah, I'd say polish off recurring and kickstart. Um, Rethink Payment API, launch Centaur Insights, and then really pay attention to the order management interface and that B2B feature set. I mean, I, I think we've probably rewritten the G-Commerce module two or three times now. <laughs> uh, yeah, we wrote, wrote a few times. So. Yeah, 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 that's true. Uh, and so, like, you know, you know, just like really focusing on that B2B feature set would be good because that, like, that's where mo most of our customers have some form of B2B component, whether they're nonprofits, higher ed, or just a merchant. Uh, like, I think like our last three or four customers have been B2B, and their supply companies or B2B SaaS platforms using our software. Like, it's, you know, something we'd, we would do good to pay more attention to, so. Yeah. Well, it's 2.30, so we can wrap up, and I'm happy to gab about it or talk code, or if you have a customer that you're stuck on and need me to help you troubleshoot it real fast, we can go co-work in the hallway, so. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you. Yeah.